Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're taking a look at the NVIDIA Titan V PCB. So, you know, without any delay, let's get right into it. We'll start with the various VRMs that are located on the card, and then we're going to go into some of the details for the vCore VRM, the HBM VRM, and also how you could lift the power limit on this thing because, uh, well, it chokes on the power limit pretty hard out of the box. Uh, even after you increase it, um, you know, to the limit that the software allows, this card is still very, 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 very power limited. Um, as NVIDIA only allows you to m increase the uh, stock power limit by another 20%. Before we get into those, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and their 1080 Ti SC2, which we've recommended fairly highly for its build quality and uh, the ICX sensors, which are kind of fun to play with. You can check our full SC2 review for the 1080 Ti if you're curious to learn more, or you can click the link in the description below to find the product page for the 1080 Ti SC2. Anyway, let's get uh, into the VRMs, starting with the very oddly laid out vCore VRM. So you get one set of phases for vCore right here, uh, and then you go across the card and get another set of phases for vCore on the other side. Um, this VRM layout uh, is you know, is pretty much optimal. Um, it gets the VRM as close to the load, which would be the GPU here, as is possible for a, you know, PCB format of this kind. Um, and the reason why getting the VRM as close to the GPU core as possible is important is that, well, the less distance the current from the VRM has to travel, um, the less voltage drop you get across the power plane and the better you get and uh, better transient response you get because obviously if there's a big change in power consumption from the GPU core, uh, that change in current demand has to uh, take some time to propagate. So the longer uh, your power plane is, the bigger the delay um, between um, the current draw from the GPU core and it getting to the actual capacitor banks and the inductors. Um, which results in slightly worse uh, voltage regulation. So this VRM layout is definitely really, really good. Um, behind that, we find the v, uh, the HBM VRM. Now, the HBM VRM has kind of wh where the vCore VRM sort of got layout, PCB layout priority. The HBM VRM is uh, actually behind the vCore VRMs. Uh, one of the vCore VRM, fa uh, you know, parts of the vCore VRM. This is really awkward for me to deal with because most cards, you just have one big block. Um, even if that block might not necessarily, you know, like Vega has an L shape, but this is two separate blocks. But uh, the HBM VRM is located um, behind one of the sets of vCore phases. And this does actually negatively impact the voltage drop uh, from the HBM VRM. Luckily, the HBM isn't super, you know, high power draw or anything. So it's not, you know, it's not as critical to have the HBM VRM as close to the card as possible, but it is noticeable as the uh, voltage coming out of the HBM VRM is pretty high considering what actually ends up getting to the HBM stacks that you have on the uh, GPU. So, you know, that's the HBM VRM. And then you get the two minor VRMs up here. So this one and this one, we will not be going into the details of these. I'm not actually sure which one does what, but basically this card requires two more voltages in order to function. Uh, one of them is the PEX voltage. This is typically between 0.9 volts and one volt. Um, this powers the PCI interface as well as some of the PLLs inside the GPU core. Uh, this voltage is completely useless on air cooling. I mean, obviously the card won't work without it, but worrying about tweaking this voltage is pointless. It doesn't, it won't help you overclock any higher. Um, the other voltage you get is the 1.8 volts uh, VPP as well as BIOS voltage. So NVIDIA cards have a, the, the BIOS system on NVIDIA cards runs on 1.8 volts. Uh, the HBM also has a supporting voltage of 1.8 volts. This is similar to GDDR5X, so this is not a huge difference from what you would normally see on an NVIDIA card. So those are your two minor rails. I'm not sure which one does what, but there's both of these have to be present on this card to function. Um, another interesting thing you kind of find on this PCB is, well is these two groups of four MOSFETs right here. Um, I am not one, like, I do not have confirmation on what these actually do, and unfortunately, uh, the card is in the US, and I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, you know, in, in Europe, so um, 
I've not had a chance to probe this myself. And well, trying trying to get, you know, long range measurements just does not work for these kinds of things. So uh, I'm not 100% certain what these do, but based on the fact that there's an inductor right in front of them and that they're, uh, well, you know, between the PCIe 8 pins and the vCore VRM, I have a sneaking suspicion that NVIDIA, these might be actual uh, sort of sub VRMs, uh, which would be used for boosting VRM efficiency because uh, when you have, well, basically VR, uh, converting, D, doing DC-DC voltage conversions from say uh, 12 volts to anything less than 1.2 volts um, tends to be pretty inefficient due to the very low duty cycle that you end up running. Um, and, uh, you know, the GV100 here, it runs on voltages anywhere from 0 0.75 volts at full load to 1.093 volts. Uh, full load. So it's very much in that sort of, it's outside the sweet spot for your uh, 12 volts down conversion. Um, and Intel, for example, deals with this on their multi very high core count Xeons, which run on very low voltage, very high current. They deal with that by having a fully integrated voltage regulator. Uh, Intel, uh, NVIDIA doesn't have one. So what I assume they're doing is they're, this, this set of MOSFETs right here and this inductor basically would step down 12 volts to something like 8 volts, and that would slightly boost the actual efficiency of the main vCore VRM without really costing you a lot of power because this is a low current VRM, high voltage, um, high voltage output. So th this can be very efficient without too much difficulty, and it could significantly improve the actual efficiency of the conversion of the, uh, of the vCore VRM. But without the card in hand, I, I can't say for sure that that's exactly what it does. Um, but you do get two of these, which would nicely line up with the fact that you have two, you know, power connectors. So, yeah, I'm just that's just my theory on what they do. I'm not 100% certain. Um, so, with that out of the way, let's get right into the actual um, sort of meat of this, which is the details of the vCore VRM and the HBM VRM. So the vCore VRM is an absolute monstrosity. It may look like a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 phase vCore VRM design. However, it's not actually a 16 phase, at least not with the way it's driven. You do have 16 inductors, you do have 16 power stages, you do not have 16 interleaved PWM signals. Back of the card here, you can actually see that the card has uh, mounts for PWM doubler chips, but they're unoccupied. So this card, how it deals with the VRM is that I assume this voltage controller right here is for vCore. Unfortunately, NVIDIA decided that the voltage controllers on this card are two of the same chip. So I'm not sure which one does what, um, because either could drive either VRM. They both have the right phase counts for it. But either way, this is a M monolithic power systems, which I'm just going to abbreviate as uh, MPS, which is their company logo. Um, this is an MP2888. Uh, I'm not sure about the feature set of these chips. Um, I do know they do go up to eight phase VR, uh, eight phase output, and they do switching frequencies in excess of 300 kilohertz. Uh, however, there is no public data sheet, so I, I can't really give you any uh, details on what other features these offer. But either way, um, on this card, they are running. Uh, you know, one of them is running eight phase mode, 300 kilohertz for the vCore VRM. The other one is running two-phase mode for the HBM. But basically, the card is essentially a massive eight-phase because of the lack of doublers. So normally, if you had a doubling scheme, you basically would have uh, eight PWM signals getting uh, multiplied into uh, 16 by the actual doublers. And here what you get is you basically have eight PWM signals and... Uh, well, if we have like a, say we have one PWM signal go here, PWM1, then that signal also goes to one, one other chip. So uh, essentially why this looks like an eight phase is that you have two phases turn on at the same time. Um, however, this does still have benefits. Um, 
the huge number of power stages and inductors means you get very good thermal performance because the VRM is absolute like it has a huge amount of surface area. Uh, the other thing is um, the actual power stages are extremely high end and you basically cut the current load on each power stage in half by basically having two of them turn on at the same time. So th th this VRM is, it, it ends up being ridiculously powerful because these aren't any old, uh, you know, any old power stages. No, these are Fairchild Semiconductor. And I, I, my C is terrible. So this, these are Fairchild Semiconductor FDMF 3170s. And the thing is, these are 70 amp smart power stages. So just SPS for short. Um, and the reason why these are, well, so they're 70 amps max output. Um, well, they won't actually shut down at 70 amps. They shut down at 80 amps. So that's part of the smart uh, power stage functionality. They have a built-in overcurrent protection of 88, uh, 80 amps. Um, and they have a built-in over temperature protection of 136 degrees centigrade. So basically, once they hit 136 degrees centigrade, they raise a flag that, hey, um, the VRM is kind of overheating here. You might want to shut it down. The OCP, on the other hand, shuts down the power stage the moment uh, the current value is ex uh, exceeded for the time period specified in the data sheet. So basically, uh, you don't have to worry about this VRM, uh, you know, destroying itself or anything because it has built-in temperature monitoring, built-in current monitoring, and built-in protection features right on the power stages themselves. Uh, they are capable of sustaining up to 70 amps output. However, at that point, their heat output is about 14 watts each, um, which... You know that's just unsustainable so if you had one of these chips and a big enough heatsink for it yeah you you could actually push 70 amps through it uh in a 16 phase vrm design on a cramped pcb like this uh that is not gonna work um luckily the titan v doesn't really pull that much power it does do it at very low voltages but it really doesn't pull that much power on the stock power limit you're only looking at about 200 amps coming through the vrm um because I'm assuming there's another 50 watts of power dedicated rest, uh, to the rest of the PCB. And you're looking at about, you know, so you're looking at about 200 watts going into the GPU core, which at around one volt works out to about 200 amps current output. Obviously at the lower voltages, it would actually be more current output on the, with the power limit maxed out. So with plus 20% power limit, you're going to be looking at the whole card pulling about 300 watts. I'm going to assume that it's still pulling the same amount of power for the fan and the HBM because we're only looking at the core power consumption here because that, well, I, I'm, that, that's an assumption, but is a, probably a pretty good one. In general, that works out. Um, and then with the lifted plus 20% power limit, you'd basically be looking at something like 250 amps output for the vCore VRM, which for these monstrously overpowered um, smart power stages is really not a workout, which is really, really good because it means this VRM ends up being ridiculously efficient. Um, and in fact, it ends up being a ridiculous overkill. I think um, this might be because the this PCB is probably used for Teslas as well that go into outright data centers. And uh, well, data centers want tip-top reliability. So, you know, anything less than massive overkill is just kind of not acceptable there. So the end result is that at these typical current figures, both at around one volt output, because really the, at, on stock, the voltage output fluctuates so much, it's really hard to say. And on uh, on the plus 20% power limit, it actually ends up hovering around point, uh, 0.993 volts. Um, well, I'd like to say at one volt, uh, you know, for these current outputs, I have uh, actual heat dissipation numbers for these power stages. Unfortunately, the data sheet for these power stages does not specify um, how output voltage impacts efficiency. So the data sheet is entirely spec'd at 1.8 volts. However, at 1.8 volts, 200 amps output, you'd be looking at 19 watts of heat output for the entire vCore VRM. So spread across this much air surface area, that's going to be nothing. And I would like to point out that um, these power stages should get more efficient at lower output voltages because this is uh, they're optimized for 10% to 15% duty cycle. That 1.8 volts output is on the high side of that uh, 10 to 15%. So 
realistically, you're going to be looking at less than 19 watts of heat output at stock. And for uh, plus 20% power limit, you're going to be looking less than 24 watts heat output. Because again, it's 1.8 volts, 300 kilohertz switching frequency for the whole VRM, which I did mention earlier. So really, really efficient. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to say how this compares directly against some other top end, uh, you know, say GTX 1080 Ti VRMs, like say a Hall of Fame. Because for those, I actually have data sheets that work at lower voltages. And uh, um, yeah, it, it's hard to do the comparison when these are only rated at 1.8 volts. Um, they should be right about in line with the other power stages that are used on, say, a GTX 1080 Ti Hall of Fame or a GTX 1080 Ti Kingpin Edition. In fact, this VRM is more powerful than what you would find on a GTX 1080 Ti Kingpin Edition and probably more powerful than what you find on the Hall of Fame 2, just because these power stages do max out at 70 amps instead of the 80, uh, instead of the 60 amps that the International Rectifier 3575 and the 3555 used on the Hall of Fame and the Kingpin uh, max out at. So basically, NVIDIA has, for the first time, built a card where I'm, I'm going to say... Um, you don't need to upgrade the VRM on this. You're gonna need to strap a pretty big heatsink to the VRM, maybe get a lot of airflow, so very high RPM fan if you're gonna take this on liquid nitrogen, which I doubt anybody will do because, you know, the card is $3,000. But on the off chance that, you know, <laughs> you want to take one of these on liquid nitrogen, um, you don't, you shouldn't have to worry about the VRM. And if there is a VRM problem on this thing, um, there's not really an alternative, unfortunately. They don't make a 32-phase e-power that I'm aware of, at least. So there's not much, you know, there's not much room to upgrade the VRM. This is pretty much the peak of GPU VRM power capability. Certainly, I think it would be better if it interleaved and maybe ran at a higher switching frequency after interleaving. But at least in terms of raw power output, this thing is an absolute beast. And to put a real number on that... Well, let's say you wanted to push 600 amps through this monstrosity. At, again, that 1.8 volts figure, it would only produce about 90 watts of heat, which is in line with every other top-end uh, 1080 Ti, as well as any other top-end uh, extreme overclocking GPU that I've ever seen in terms of VRM heat dissipation. So, yeah, th this thing is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, in terms of the vCore VRM design. So nothing to complain about, unfortunately. Except, you know, it, it could actually get 16 phases. I think here, 16 phases would be justifiable compared to like 1080 Ti's, and you can, you can get away with 10, you can get away with 12 or 16. Um, but here, I, it's like, those, those doublers don't cost that much. There's footprints on the PCB already for them. Why aren't they there? I have no idea. But power-wise... I, I've, I've got no complaints. Now then, let's move on to the HBM VRM. The HBM VRM, as you can clearly see, is a one-two phase affair. The third phase took a vacation, I think, along with the HBM stack that is actually disabled on the Titan V um, as the GV100 chip. Um, in its full implementation, this would come with four working HBM stacks. This version only has three. So I assume that one of the phases got taken away because, well, you're not running all four stacks of HBM. You're only running three. So you can, you know, you can get rid of that extra phase. The power stages are exactly the same as what you had for the vCore VRM. So again, massive freaking overkill for a assumed output of about 35 amps. Um, for the HBM, which I think might be a little bit high, or maybe I'm overestimating the vCore VRM output currents. Um, for 35 amps at, well, again, that 1.8 volts, because the same power stage with the equally limited power uh, data sheet, you'd be looking at power consumption below 40 watts uh, for this VRM. So... In terms of at least uh, efficiency, there's nothing to complain about. It's, it's a two-phase memory VRM, so... You know, th this is more phases than a Fury X had for its HBM1. This is more phases than a Vega has for its HBM. Uh, I, I can't complain about this. Again, very, very impressive. Controlled by the same monolithic power systems, MP2888 voltage controller, but this time configured for only two phases. I imagine there's some versions of this card where it has the full three phases. I assume that would be the Tesla version. So... 
yeah, again, just Nvidia, like where where did this come from? <laughs> like I'm super surprised because I'm used to seeing, you know, reference Nvidia PCBs and recently they've gotten a lot better, but most of the time it was a case of like this this is kind of unimpressive to especially on some dual GPU and Nvidia cards, it was actually outright concerning. Like, how long do you expect this VRM to last? I imagine, you know, no overclocking allowed is is a policy that actually, for example, a GTX 590 doesn't support overclocking at all, specifically because the VRM on that was so shoddy. But this is just like, th this is up there. This is up there with the Hall of Fame. This is up there with the Kingpin Edition. Arguably, this has the... Uh, better VRM layout than basically any other extreme overclocking card because, as I said before, the, you have the vCore VRM flanking either side of the GPU core, um, which there was some LN2, like there was some extreme overclocking GPUs and high phase count VRMs that we've seen on exam uh, 1080 Ti's, 980 Ti's, and a few other cards where they would actually like put two rows of phases behind each other which like it works out great for your power capabilities, but you end up in a situation where you're wasting power on uh, on basically just getting power from the furthest set of phases to the GPU core. So this thing is just like amazing, like absolutely amazing. I, I'm not, I mean, I, I've never had any doubt Nvidia could design a good VRM. I never thought they would want to, but they have. This is awesome. Now then, let's go and take uh, take the chains off and lift those power limits. So the card has an interesting power uh, monitoring situation. There's actually way more shunts on this than you would expect. There's only three 12 volt inputs. You have plus 12 volts on the PCIe. You have plus 12 volts on the six pin. You have plus 12 volts on the eight pin. But for some reason, there's three current monitoring shunt resistors. So you have one down here, which would be for the PCIe slot. This one up here, which is probably for the six pin. This one down here, which is for the eight pin. And you have an INA3221 Texas. Uh, this is a chip from uh, Texas Instruments. Uh, NVIDIA's favorite voltage, uh, well, current and voltage monitoring chip for basically monitoring power consumption. So this thing is really easy to trick. Um, I, I've done it on a 1070. You can actually do all kinds of, if you feel like doing a lot of soldering, you can basically desolder the monitoring circuit that this normally runs on the actual power inputs and you can replace it with uh um well you can set up a voltage divider from plus 12 volts um which you can source from the pcie slot or the eight pin or the six pin you set up a voltage divider and you can feed very completely fake voltages into the actual monitoring inputs uh, that will remove all power limits um, you can also use resistors of varying sizes to reduce power readings by up to five times and the last option, which is probably the option most people will opt for is, well, most people, there's not that many people with this. So this is going to be like, what, three people on earth are going to do this. But the last option is that you put liquid metal across the actual shunt resistor, or um, you can go with, uh, with conductive ink pens. And you can basically just draw across the shunt resistors. This lowers the electrical resistance of the shunt. And the way shunts work is the, well, the INA3221 just monitors the voltage drop across the shunt resistor. And from that voltage drop, it calculates the amount of current going into the card. And also, since it's monitoring the voltages, um, it does current times voltage equals power consumption. And that's how the NVIDIA driver knows how much power the card is pulling. And if it needs to lower the core clock or if it can just go wild. Well, if you tweak the resistances on the shunts or, you know, just completely fake all the measurements for the INA3221, uh, the driver will not know how much power the card is pulling. And as long as it thinks it's pulling less power than the maximum, uh, than the power limit, it'll allow the card to clock higher and higher and higher and let you push basically as much power as you could possibly want. So... That's the shunt mod. Um, there's also this shunt down here, but I would recommend that um, you basically don't touch that one because I can't figure out what it's hooked up to and why it's there. Um, if I had the card in hand, I could probably figure out what it's for, but as it is right now, I have no idea. So I would just not bother with that one um, for safety's sake. Uh, so yeah, that, that covers the PCB. The only other side note I have, I have about this thing is there is a lot of unoccupied solder pads on this. It almost looks like an engineer, like I guess it, it 
it kind of it just kind of looks like an engineering sample PCB, but I guess this thing is so low production volume. Or maybe it's just um, since it's a professional card, it might be because they want to be able to uh, check for any damages better. But yeah, th this thing, this PCB is really cramped and there is a lot of unoccupied solder pads, which I find really odd, but there's no neg there's no real downside to that. Um, there's also the missing 8-pin up here, but we've been seeing that on a lot of high-end NVIDIA cards for a while now, so I don't find that surprising even remotely. But yeah, th this thing, you know, if, if you're buying a $3,000 GPU, um, especially this one, you can be at least certain that for once you're getting a VRM that's more or less worth the $3,000 asking price on the card. I still say I would like to see doublers, but, you know, power capability wise, this is, this is amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like to see doublers because with more interleaving phases, you basically get better VRM ripple, uh, voltage ripple, but, um, going from eight phases to 16 phases tends not to make as much of a difference as going from say three to eight. Um, so NVIDIA probably calculated that past this phase count, it doesn't really make a difference for their usual applications and decided that we're just going to keep the efficiency of the 16 phase monstrosity that we built. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's fine. But I'd still like to see a 16 phase. And that's it for this PCB breakdown. Thank you for watching. Uh, like, share, comment, leave a comment down below or any questions. Uh, if you would like to support what we do here at Gamers Nexus, we have a Patreon. You can find a link down in the description to, below for that. And if you would like to see more overclocking related videos, I have my own channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking. I do other PCB breakdowns for GPUs, motherboards, and I also do various modification guides, experiments, overclocking live streams, and all kinds of other overclocking related content. Thank you for watching and see you next time.